There we are. Hello and welcome to Butterfly Magic with Hot Tea. So nice to see you again. Thanks for coming. Um, and I do have my hot tea. It's kind of more of a lukewarm tea as it as it is now. It's um, uh, honey bush, mandarin, and orange by Twinnings. I love it. And who doesn't love a kitty cat mug with glasses? Okay. So I'm really liking this. This is kind of a, a good way for me that I, to wind down at the end of my day. Um, essentially, I take caffeinated drinks in the in the daytime when I want to wind up in the morning and become alert. And towards the end of the day, I really want to make sure that I'm working towards restorative sleep. So uh, I want something that's not caffeinated. And so this is this is one of the soothing ways that I uh, do some self care. Uh, and I wind down with a nice warm warm drink. And this is probably my favorite one of my non-caffeinated drinks. Okay, there's a nice sideline. <laughs> um, I want to talk about a book today. And um, here's the cover. It's called The Defining Decade by Meg J. Uh, so The Defining Decade, Why Your 20s Matter and How to Make the Most of Them Now. I really do appreciate a lot of um, ideas from this book. Uh, it has a, a really good place, I think, in developmental psychology. I appreciate that it talks about developmental psychology of the early adult, of the young adult. Um, having worked in the field of early childhood education, um, I, I did study developmental psychology for young for young people, right? So by so many months, they can roll over. By this certain age, they have object permanence. By, you know, this age, they can, they have, you know, mathematical skills. They can understand a one-to-one -one correspondence, one thing in each hand, you know, this sort of thing. And then you, as, as an educator, you need to kind of scaffold them from one level to the next. So all of that has been really studied to, to the nth degree. So we really, really watch our little people a lot. But not as much uh, information is compartmentalized in different decades of life. And so I appreciate this because it rather compartmentalizes a developmental stage or, you know, a few developmental stages um, in what she calls the 20-somethings. So if you are a 20-something, you're somewhere between the ages of, say, about 20 to 35, although there's no kind of cut, start, and end date. It's the developmental stages that she goes through. And so um, those those developmental stages are... Uh, set within the sections in her book and there are three so one is work and then she has some chapters that talk about that and then she talks about love and so that she talks about the romantic relationships in a few chapters um, in there and then the last section is what she calls a uh, brain and body and there she kind of talks about other items that she hasn't really broached in in the um, previous sections and um, it, it's a nice way to end the book. So overall, it's a really good read. It's a very casual language, sometimes a little bit more casual than I would like uh, for myself. And that's just because I'm rather meticulous and particular about things. And so that's the geek in me. That's just the geek in me. And, the, you know, hence the, you know, she doesn't number her chapters like why would that be a pet peeve for anybody the book still reads itself pretty you know pretty well you can read the book so um it's accessible language uh you read through it it's you know easy to understand um and i like that it's a very casual language that when you pick it up it's not overwhelming you just it it's um it's a very it's a very easy read um so uh, what do I want to start with? Okay, so we're going to start with the first section. Okay, we're going to start with the first. Oh, I should also mention um, a star rating. <laughs> you know, we have to do a star rating. We don't have to, but um, I guess on five stars, I would give it a three, possibly a three and a half. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. I like it for its place in, in um, the literature of developmental psychology. Um, I like that it starts and generates a lot of conversations, um, but I don't necessarily, I don't really always jive with the ideas that she's setting forth because sometimes what she's talking about is a template or an ideal. Uh, I'm thinking there's a lot of people who could meet the definition of success differently. And so for that, I, I think other people's lifestyles could be explored. Um, yeah, so there's that. 
So it, it kind of uh, didn't get a five star for that reason. And also just some editing things. Um, so yeah, I think overall it's a really great read. And yeah, I recommend anything over a, a three is good. Um, okay, so the first section, we're going to look at work. What she talks about in terms of work in this developmental stage of life. Um, identity capital is refers to the assets that you have personally, what you can contribute, what you develop, the skill set that you develop so that you can bring it to your your um, your job, essentially, right? She um, advises to take jobs that, I mean, let's face it, at 20 years old, you may not end up finding the job of your dreams. You're going to find something that is going to give you experience so that you can get something else, right? Um, jobs in the food industry, jobs with minimum wage, um, you work really hard for your money. You don't necessarily um, end up developing all the skills that you might need for the job that you want later on. Sometimes taking uh, jobs, um, sometimes there are jobs that you are taking because you need to pay the bills right now and there's value in that. Um, is it the job that's for you that you're going to really flourish in that uh, works well with your aptitude, with your personality, with your skill set and helps you to develop um, more skills? So, you know, for your future career goals. Um, that's what she's talking about with identity capital. He gave the example um, of developing identity capital through a job that she had. Uh, I hope I'm going to describe this as close to her story as possible, where um, she, she, was she was going through hiking and uh, walking people through whatever wilderness there was and giving them tours and um, explaining things. And so through this job that she did, it was really physically demanding. Um, and she she was able to kind of get some fitness goals too with that, I guess. Um, she was also developing personality um, and interpersonal skills and social skills and management skills and things that helped her in jobs later on. So when she looks back at that, she, she sees it as a time where it was a really good job choice, a good, good option to do that. Although the pay might have not been as much as she probably would have wanted to. And the hours are extraordinarily long because she's out in the middle of a wilderness and it's not like you punch your clock and then just suddenly spontaneously become, you know, back at home. Um, so yeah, it helped her to develop that, that identity capital. Another point that she brings up is this search for glory. It's a search for glory, she says, is a term that was originally coined by uh, Karen Horney. If you want to look up that reference, um, and essentially it's the whole idea of feeling deficient because of certain ideals or shoulds that are imposed on us. It's this, it's kind of like um, when your parents give you ideals, right? As opposed to what's real. So you have an ideal, you have an idea of what the principle, the ideal situation would be and you strive to achieve that um, perhaps because that's what your parents said you should be doing um, and if you feel like you haven't achieved that ideal then you feel deficient if you have negative self-talk you feel less successful and that is the search for glory um it used to be uh likened to keeping up with the joneses Right? But as she adapts her language for her audience, which is the 20-somethings, she says that keeping up with the Joneses today is kind of like keeping up with the Kardashians 
where you have, um, you know, keeping up with the Joneses would have been looking over the fence and seeing your neighbors, the Joneses, and wanting their car because they have a better car and they have a better family and they have a better marriage and they have a, you know, nicer whatever. Uh, and so you want to keep up with those Joneses. But today we are looking online and we want to keep up with everybody else's lifestyle. So if they're doing da 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 X, Y, Z, then we feel deficient. Uh, we haven't reached the ideal. We compare ourselves to the people that we see on Instagram, as she says, or any of the other online uh, resources. Um, the the other side to that coin, the uh, the downside to that is that when posts when people are posting things, it's polished. It's a snapshot of one moment in their life that's carefully contrived and staged and the lighting and so on. And it's perfected and practiced. I mean, even for this video, I've started and stopped it a number of times and I've done it to completion. Well, I don't know. I, this is the second time I'm trying to do it to completion. So, um, you know, even this is not just with all the mistakes and stuff that's that's in here that, that could have been. So this is part of the um, self-deprecation that we have when we search for that glory, when we kind of try and get that ideal. Um, and so she she calls that the tyranny of the shoulds, when you're shooting all over yourself. Um, I should be living up to this and I'm not. And so therefore I'm lacking. Uh, it's kind of a way of being really hard on yourself and like, don't do that. <laughs> Be very kind to yourself. Um, so I like the way that she paid attention to that as something really relevant in our culture, in our society today, um, for people who are young adults who are striving to do the best that they can. And the best that you can is not really having to do with what everybody else achieves uh, because you're only getting a snapshot, a very contrived snapshot of everybody's life, right? So Meg Jay also talks about uh, customizing your life. She has an analogy where she um, says, just as you would customize a bike, right? You can customize your life. So when you're customizing your bike, you would order the frame, the wheels, the I don't know, trim, whatever it is that you have on a bike that you can customize that, that bike. And in that way, you can customize your life. So when you're making choices for, say, jobs, you don't just kind of look on the the want ads and pick something, start applying and just throw the dice. And if they give you an interview and they give you the job, then you just show up and, you, and then what? Uh, do you have that identity capital? Is this job really good for you? Or, or does it, does it require skills that you don't have and that you don't, that are not really part of your aptitude? Does it require for you to be an extrovert when you're an introvert and then you feel deficient and you feel like you're not living your best life in this job, right? And you wonder why? Well, maybe the job is not the best one for you. So customizing the job choices based on your personal skill set. And sometimes that takes some introspection. Sometimes that takes, you know, advice from career advisors. So I do appreciate that she, she does put some light on this. Um, it's something that we really want to be aware of um, when choosing, for instance, post-secondary um, programs or, or jobs. So section number two, I'm going to call it section number two. It's just con section love. It's called love. And uh, she develops love as a part of a really relevant developmental stage um, in your 20-somethings. And she, here's where, you know, I have, I have thoughts, <laughs> I have opinions, and they don't necessarily jive with what she's, what she's um, developing. So I'm just going to deliver it in the best way I can. I'm going to talk about what she says. Um, and she says that um, the person that you marry is the most important uh, decision of your life. Um, now I tend to think if you're going to be married, that's a really important decision. Um, but that there's probably a lot of decisions, <laughs> but I get what she's saying though, because if you're going to be married, it's going to be something that shapes a lot of your life, especially if you stay married, right? And if you don't stay married, the person you're pairing yourself with is going to be part of your life 
um, financially and logistically for a very long time, especially if there are children involved, right? So this, this is the kind of the context that she's, she's um, explaining the choice of partner. Some people don't want partners and that's okay. That's okay. Um, but she's talking about also dating. Um, she talks about dating as a prequel to marriage and it can be. Um, dating can be, you know, I don't know, a career move of its own, I guess. Uh, some people are content dating indefinitely. Some people date and then don't date and don't get married forever. Um, that's okay too. But she, she does focus on, on, uh, when you're dating, pay attention to the, the partner's family because you're going to be marrying into that family. If you marry this person. How, how do they problem solve? How do they interact? What are their roles in the family? You want to kind of go through a number of seasons uh, to explore this and find out if it's something that you want to adopt as part of your, your life. I, I can appreciate where she's coming from. Um, then she talks about this cohabitation effect. She terms the... the, the the, she, she coins the term cohabitation effect. Um, and essentially in there, she's saying that living together does not decrease the possibility of divorce. So some people will decide, okay, we've been dating for a while. Let's go to the next logical step and live together. And then we're going to figure out whether we want to be married because that's going to give us a real sort of a dry run as to whether marriage um, is the way to go. And she's putting a stick in that wheel and saying, it doesn't mean that you're going to de decrease the possibility of di divorce. And I agree with what she's saying because um, I've personally known people who cohabitated for such a long time, meaning like um, the better part of a decade or more. And then soon after they get married, soon, meaning like within a year, they get divorced. There's a lot of dynamics that that happen there um, and you can't sort of paint them all with the same blanket statements as to why that happens but she's presenting uh, cohabitating kind of postpones delays the marriage and if somebody is not wanting to engage uh, and, and move on with marriage it's, she's sort of like not liking <laughs> the she's not selling that cohabitation um, as as a, as a real uh, positive feature there for, for, uh, pre-marriage skills, I guess. Uh, and, and I, I can't, I can't deliver that without, without putting my two cents in. So I, I happen to have ideas. I am a much broader kind of a, a thinker than that. Um, but I do agree that living together doesn't necessarily, uh, decrease the possibility of divorce. <laughs> but that's true, I guess. In fact, she says that um, moving in together with somebody can increase the chances of making a mistake or spending more time with somebody who's not likely to marry you. So if, for instance, you want to be married, if that is a truism for you, that moving in with somebody could mean that you're postponing the breakup later on because they may be just quite content with, with, uh, with cohabitating and not um, aiming to marry. Did I say that right? They may be content with cohabitating and not resulting in marriage, not aiming for marriage. Um, I'd probably be the person who doesn't aim for marriage. So maybe that's why I'm reacting to what she's saying. So <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, there is a section in her book that I'm particularly keen on and for no other reason, for, for if, if for no other reason, I think that this is, um, a good reason to buy the book. So, um, over here, she talks, there's a chapter called 29 conversations and, uh, these are 29 conversations that are worth having in your relationship when you're exploring sort of the groundwork for compatibility. These are good questions. Uh, let's see here. How do you like to keep house? That's question number 12. And then there's some sub questions 
there too. Like how organized are you and do you prefer clutter or minimalism and this sort of thing. So every question, every topic has a whole lot of other questions beneath it. These are good, good um, conversations to have. And some, you know, especially if somebody says something and presents, you know, a, a, an answer and then in their, in their um, practical life, like in real reality, Maybe they say they, they like to have things organized, but in their reality, maybe they're not as organized at, you know, as they say they are, or what they think is organized is not organized for you, right? Or their way of organizing things is to keep things in an organized mess, and that that would maybe drive you nuts, right? So um, that's, that's one of the 29 questions. Another one is, uh, do number seven, uh, do we share the same political ideas? And if not, do we care? <laughs> I love that one. I love that one. Um, who shares the cooking? Who shares the, you know, how do you uh, distribute the chores in the house? Right? Do you hire somebody? <laughs> what are you making for supper? Um, reservations? I, I don't know. So those are really great, great uh, questions um, and topics of conversation for relationships. There was one thing that she mentioned in that uh, in that section um, that I kind of didn't I would have explained differently, I believe. Uh, and that's the whole kind of concept of dating down. She calls um, dating down. And um, she she talks about like a some kind of a value system where you might rate yourself on a scale from zero to ten. Um, and although scaling can be really useful in some therapeutic, you know, um, aspects, um, I think by assessing somebody else as being somewhere on a scale from zero to 10 can be a bit judgmental, can be very judgmental. And so if you're dating down, the concept of dating down means somebody is at a lower level than you are. Um, and the whole development around that, I would have approached that differently. I would have been talking about perhaps um, compatibility and self-esteem and problem solving and conflict resolution and um, comparing the skill set and whether you're okay with that. And, you know, I just, I would have dealt with that differently, but she, she does spend some time talking about compatibility and really exploring what the other person is. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a really interesting chapter. Then she gets on to the section of the brain and the body. And this is a series of like a couple of chapters where she development, she develops some, some good ideas about um, self-regulation. She doesn't call it self-regulation basically, but she talks about um, emotions and um, how you manage through them. Um, like for instance, what she calls calming down, calming yourself. Uh, she refers to MRI experiments that uh, measured how 20 somethings reacted to negative stimuli and how older folks in different developmental stages of their life in their, in their um, midlife or golden years and, and how they reacted differently to the negative stimuli. They didn't react as strongly was the word um, than as the as the younger 20 somethings and that makes a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons i'm sure if i were to look up those articles i'd probably find um, items like uh, novelty right when you first start seeing some negative feedback and some challenges in life and you have limited resources in your 20 somethings because you have less job experience and less overall life experience and less um problem solving skills through the challenges that you're actually living through are going to be teaching you how to solve problems later on in life, right? So that's upsetting, changes stress. And so, yeah, you're going to act a lot more uh, negatively or strongly to this negative stimuli. That makes sense. That makes sense to me. Whereas once you've been around the block a few times, these things are not as new. These things are not as challenging. You've, you've problem solved these things before. And so later on in years, um, life, in my opinion, gets a little easier, right? So there's that. So she talks about calming yourself uh, so that you can get through those challenges. And that just sounds like a lot of really good self-regulation. Um, is this something that you develop in your 20s, in your 20-somethings? Uh, I think it 
in my opinion, this is not in the book, but in my opinion, we really, really do our children uh, a disservice by not teaching them these things in school. We do a disservice to our children and to our society as a whole by not teaching these things to children in school. Um, many parents teach what they know. They don't teach it necessarily to their children. If they can, if they've acquired the skills through their own parents or through learning on their own or through some other means, that's great. Uh, but to standardize the emotional regulation, the conflict resolution, and the um, interpersonal skills and stuff that you absolutely need uh, to be in our world, to live, to strategize, to self-regulate in our world, we really do a disservice by not giving that to our kids. Every year in, the, in their development <clears throat> from K to 12, absolutely, that should be like math every day right? That those should be some exercises. This, Yeah, I have, I have a few pet peeves um, when it comes to uh, shortchanging our kids. So when it comes to this book, uh, Meg Jay talks about these, the skill set um, being developed in the 20-somethings. And I, and I would hope, I would anticipate that it would have started earlier, but definitely uh, in your 20-somethings, it's something that... Um, that will serve you well in your job search and in your search for love and romance and uh, compatibility and um, in your interpersonal relationships. If you take the time to do some research, to read some books, uh, to go to your favorite YouTubers, to, you know, pick up some articles or whatever, like give you some strategies to better problem solve because life is not that easy. You know, it is challenging. And yeah, there were a few other other kind of points there as well, where she says staying in the moment, <clears throat> um, even though you're you're forward thinking and so on. But I do want to touch on the point um, here where it is talking about the brain and body, and the body part uh, is a chapter um, on fertility. Mostly it's about fertility and the, the issues related around fertility. And I, if memory serves me correctly, I wrote this a few weeks ago, but I think she, she does kind of say that if you're, if you're not interested in having children or this is more kind of um, relevant for, for women um, because um, uh, being able to produce children with uh, a woman's body um, kind of limited. There's a number of years where you can do that. And yeah, when I'm talking about women, when I'm talking about women in reference to, to this, uh, I mean people who were born with XX chromosomes. That's, that's what I'm saying um, in this context. So she does have a development on um, educating yourself on fertility and how your body works, your physical body works, right? Um, the body that has the ovaries, the body that has the, the ability to uh, produce children or that ultimately might not. And what that means in terms of planning for your overall life. So in your 20, 20 somethings, and she says 20 somethings as a defining decade, but the decade itself is between 20 and 35 ish, she says. So somewhere in there, there's a 10 year span, but it's kind of fluid and it doesn't really start and end on a certain date. It's kind of like a developmental stage, right? Um, so she says that while you're looking at job and, you know, career, um, education, uh, dating, you know, moving from one partner to the next to kind of work your way up to the person perhaps that you want to have working through the jobs that you have to work your way through the career that you want to have those stepping stones she she um, emphasizes the um the limited time in which uh, fertility is possible and what that means for you that you have to sort of look at do you want to have children earlier in life uh, and be closer to your children in age? Do you want to have them later in life and have uh, more of a gap in age between you and your children? And does that mean that when you are a grandparent, assuming your kids want to have kids, um, that uh, you'll be even further on in age uh, from them? So there's, there's a few assumptions that she drops along the way, like that you uh, might want to have children, that you might only want to have children um, through biologically producing them yourself. 
Um, there's a lot of ways of having children these days at, at whatever age you're at. And some of them include fostering and adopting. And those sort of things are not kind of put into the, the chapter with fertility. Um, uh, you know, assuming you want to have children, maybe calling the issue f fertility is a little narrow. Um, you know, there's there's other ways of kind of taking care of other people's kids and getting that joy. Uh, and then you can give them back, right? So they're not as expensive. <laughs> you know, Oprah has a whole continent full of her kids, right? Um, so yeah, that's that's one of the examples of how I think sometimes um, she's a little bit more focused and narrow in the way that she's thinking. Uh, like she's selling the idea of marriage as a, as a mark of success. And this is how you date so that you kind of eliminate the people who are going to waste your time, and not get the goal of marriage and a long-term marriage. And so I, I kind of picked up those sort of opinions that, that the author seems to have in the background. Um, and because I'm more of a shades of gray, sort of out of the box thinker, um, yeah, I, I, I like the book as a point uh, for discussion. That's what I like. Then, yeah, she talks here even on page 226. I'm just looking at my notes here. Like, do the math. So if you want to have children, you want to do the math. You want to at least be aware of. And I think that that's probably the way that she would, she would frame it, is you want to be aware of so that you're not all of a sudden surprised at the age of 45 that things are not happening the way that you thought that you could. You know, just because superstars have um, have succeeded in having children after the age of whatever. Okay. Um, epilogue. The epilogue, she sort of ties things together and says, okay, bullet points. Your years matter. Um, job choices and partners, your choice of partner matters. Um, that there are no guarantees in life, right? Uh, that to be intentional with your, with the way that you live and the choices that you make, um, and that you decide what your life is right now. She talks about living in the now, and um, there's one section actually in the uh, brain and body um, section that that uh, she says that the, the amount of time that you spend on the internet, uh, um, looking up stuff, reading stuff, being entertained by, watching movies, scrolling, swiping, and so on. Those are hours uh, and days and weeks and months and years that you don't get back. That is really valuable. So if you spend a lot of your 20-something years, your very young years uh, in this critical stage in development, in front of an electronic screen, developing a relationship with a piece of mach like machinery and internet, um, how how that time is kind of lost and you could be spending it like does it does it actually move you forward towards the goals you want to achieve right interacting with people sometimes can do that really well anyway i did enjoy this book i did um i'm giving it a a three on five um i recommend it as um, a really good uh source for appreciating um, the stages of development in early adult years. And if you have other recommendations that, um, that do the same um, or, or that talk about um, any kind of stages of development that appreciates, that appreciates um, developmental psychology across the lifespan, I would really love if you could leave um, some of those book recommendations um, in the comments below. Uh, if there's something that I pick up and read, I could do a review on that later on. But um, yeah, I appreciated this. This was this was a good, uh, a good page turner, a good uh, conversation starter. Okay, onward and upward. I really thank you for stopping by, and I look forward to seeing you soon.